Welcome, everybody, to the Berean Brotherhood. God bless you all. Welcome back. We're on episode 12. And in honor of Black History Month, we want to dedicate this episode to discussing a rising religious sect called, or they identify themselves as the Black Hebrew Israelites. And um, mm. I also want to make a notice later on of some uh, notable Black theologians that have contributed a lot to Christianity. But the majority of this episode is going to be discussing our ideas, opinions, and thoughts on this movement, this rising movement of the Black Hebrew Israelites. Yes, yes, definitely. I love, I just love seeing things about them, man. It's, uh, they're just a very interesting, I, I would also call them a movement as well. I wouldn't call them like a religion or anything like that. Um, it's basically just, uh, just another BLM movement, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. or they, you know, they kind of branched off from that or either the BLM branched off from them, you know? Um, but yes, there is an interesting rise over the past, I would say maybe two, three years ish. Um, but yeah. Welcome everybody to our Hebrew, black Hebrew Israelite episode. Also, like David said, happy black history month. Here to celebrate people of all colors and all races and whatnot. But for this month in particular, we definitely think there's some cultural and historical importance to celebrating our black community. That being said, to the portion of the community watching this that happens to be part of the black Hebrew Israelites or just in general hates white people. I just wanted to ask why the white boy hate, you know, why, <laughs> why, why do you hate vanilla so much? Here I am in Wakanda with my boys. Obviously, I got the pass to the barbecue to the cookout. We're in there, Wakanda forever. Uh, I've heard the saying, once you go black, you don't go back. I just wanted to add to that. Once you go white, you know what's right. But uh, <laughs> I can say all that because technically I'm Puerto Rican. And Puerto Ricans, depending on how you classify POCs or people of color, are technically a minority. So, woo, we in there. But yes, yeah, I, I guess w my main points and uh, my kind of view on the topic in general is it's not going to be a, I guess, a critique of the black community as a whole, but to the extremist sect of the black community it, that's found in black Hebrew Israelites that has a anti-Semitic racist view of the world and has kind of co-opted a bunch of different beliefs from a bunch of different religions and philosophies to kind of make this strange amalgamation of black supremacy that is as anti-biblical as it gets, and for other reasons, um, just kind of exemplifies all of the problems that humanity faces whenever it picks a kind of group identity outside of God. But yeah, you know, Wakanda forever, baby. We put that heart there because I know some of you are T'Challa fans to this day. May you rest <laughs> in peace, Chadwick Boseman. And I had to hide some of the Black Panther goodies. But, uh, <laughs> my eyes only. Yeah, I just want to say real quick, you know, um, we don't make this, we're not making this episode to bash anyone um or anything like that we just want to spread some light to what they believe in uh refute uh things that they say you know uh and yeah we don't hate you guys we love you we just don't like what you do and yeah it's just uh i would say just they're very racist and um basically if you want to really just generalize it and just make it compact of what they believe um, if you're, if you're a person of color, you're going to heaven. Hallelujah. That's it. That's basically what it is. Mm. Um, if you really want to just like dumb it down or make it simple, whatever. Uh, but yeah, you know, the, the public interactions with the BHI groups, uh, usually occurs in large cities mm -hmm. and what we see as the representation or the face of the black Hebrew Israelite movement is, uh, radical members often standing in the streets and sidewalks debating and um, belittling um, white people or mm -hmm. who they would call the Edomites, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of scripture that's definitely taken out of context, but I see also how they use scripture to, or, you know, it's like a twisted uh, context mm -hmm. where they use it to back up what they believe, right? So things like um, God loved jacob but he hated esau and the edomites being descendants of esau um gives them the ex the, the the exclusive right to um that entitlement to have heaven right and that 
they use that out of context of he hated Edom or he hated Esau as every descendant of Edom, which is of the Caucasian or Carcassus mountains, you know, however they want to say it, that anybody with that white skin is actually cursed or is not, you know, eligible for salvation. Right. That's and um, I would say to just personal experience, born and raised in the South Bronx, I know I don't sound like it. I don't look like it. All my friends growing up were either black, Dominican, uh, Puerto Rican. I mean, I guess that's mixing ethnicity and race together, but it was generally 90% minorities, including myself, even though I, I'm as pale as a sheet of paper. But I, I was raised in neighborhoods where you had BHI or black Hebrew Israelites on street corners at times. And I remember going down 149th and 3rd Avenue sometimes. They'd be mm -hmm. on the corner, a bunch of embrolic guys. Usually the guys that are on the corners are not soft. You can tell they've been lifting while they're, they're jack dudes. Maybe some of them did some jail time because I knew a bro who told me, yeah, yeah, a bunch of guys come out of you know incarceration and they kind of find this movement or they find another movement. They go into it. It makes sense. It's got a kind of militant structure to it. It emphasizes strength and masculinity. But mm -hmm. these guys would stand. There'd be like 10 or 15 of them on the corner. I'd be just walking my other bros. They could be anything, Dominican, black, whatever. We're just walking to the bodega to get food. And the 10 of them, I guess they would ramp up the preaching when I walked by because I'm a white boy. And they would just grill me. And they would be like, yeah, because the white devils are going to get their payment. They're looking at me. I'm 15 years old. I weigh like 90 pounds at the time. You know, my neck, you could you could choke me out with your index finger and thumb. I'm walking by these guys and they really think I'm like an existential threat to them. Like these guys could bench 300 pounds at the time. I'm not just some kid, but I could at that time feel I could. It was so visceral, the amount of hatred they had for me mm -hmm. based on my race. And I I don't think that's something exclusive to me feeling that they're, you know, outside of the extremist black Hebrew Israelite factions you know, the black community has felt that kind of hatred in the United States and in all over the world, just like all people at all times have either suffered some type of racial discrimination or hatred or even enslavement. Whites have enslaved whites all throughout history. Blacks have enslaved blacks. There's been interracial enslavement. But in the United States in particular, I think maybe minority communities are a lot more vulnerable to these types of extremist ideologies, because in the U.S. in particular, I don't think any other community has suffered in the grand historical way like the black community has at the hands of what they would consider to be white oppressive communities. So we can get into the historical implications of slavery and, and the economic effect that has on generations later and debate who is to blame and who is not to blame. But I'm just saying here in 2024, it makes sense why in this culture, a lot of men, especially younger men, uh, stronger willed men would find themselves susceptible to this type of ideology because it promises to give them a sense of worth and strength and value that has been denied at least to their ancestors and to their cultural heritage for so many years in the USA, or at least that's their perception of it. So it makes sense why they would kind of look at me in that way, even though I had nothing to do with anything, but they, they're, they're vulnerable to ideologies that prey on obvious kind of sociocultural differences. And I can't think of a more obvious sociocultural difference than skin color. Yeah, I definitely think they they definitely mm -hmm. missed the mark when it comes to love, right? Because mm -hmm. they they focus a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot on the Old Testament. Um, all they do is preach the law. They never, they rarely ever talk about Christ. And if they do, it, it's it's either no, it's not either. It's always about how he's coming back to save. Uh, anyone of of color that's it right um and it's interesting how how you talked about like when you were 15 like how they just hated you right but right. we know in the new testament what does jesus say about um you know uh someone hating a brother like you've already committed murder in your heart mm -hmm. you know so you're already breaking a law so like what's going on here you all you guys do is preach about oh you got to keep the law you got to keep the law but you're hating <laughs> You know, and what what uh, you said, David, earlier about, oh, God hated Esau and stuff like that. You know, they're they taking that out of context mm -hmm. and that's all they do. They just cherry pick verses. Um, they're uh, illiterate when it comes to like hermeneutics, proper hermeneutics. You know, they do a very poor job. What's that guy's name? Nathaniel. I think he I know he's like really big. Uh, I think they call him like a prophet or something. I, I'm not sure. Or apostle. Or, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, they just do like real silly things. They they call themselves little G's, little gods, you know. Mm. Um, but at the same time, 
they claim to still be slaves. So like, what's, what's going right. on here? You know what I'm saying? Like, right, right. what's like, what are you a slave or are you a God? What's going on? You know, they remind me of a legalistic heresy from back in the uh, days of our lovely, lovely church fathers called the Ebionites. And I have a list of things that they believed, right? So they believed that the Jewish law was the highest expression of God's will and that it was still binding on humanity. Mm. Believed that Jesus was Joseph's son, adopted by God at his baptism. Weird. Liked, and, and I, I love this part right here. Liked the gospel of Matthew, and we know the, the gospel of Matthew was uh, written more towards for the uh, the uh, Jewish audience, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but they disliked the writings of Paul. If you if you speak to one of these guys, anything about Paul, you bring up any of the epistles, any of the church letters. Oh my gosh, they will like, they will go crazy. And they will just start attacking you. Oh, you're that's the gospel of Paul and this and that. It's like, come on, bro. Let's be real. He's preaching the same gospel, the same gospel Jesus preached. Um, and a couple more things. Uh, insisted that Gentile and Jewish Christians were still bound by the law of Moses. Um, and then lastly, no salvation apart from circumcision and the law of Moses. Mm. So they're just legit. They're modern day Judaizers, you know, and what do we know about them? They, they wanted, um, they, they were saying, oh, you guys have to get circumcised. You know, like the Bible says in Romans 2, 28 to 29, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward, outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, the Holy Spirit not by the letter his praise is not from man but from god so how do like how do you guys tackle that you know they 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 love to talk preach the law you know and say oh we're real jews you're not a jew because you're white and this and that but like circumcision is the matter of a heart you know how can they take that out of context <laughs> you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. but let me let me chill for a second i'll let I'll, you know i know i know you got something to say david go ahead so um, I think this, let's take into consideration some key points, right? Black Hebrew Israelite is not the same as a black Jew or Jews of color, right? Also within the black Hebrew Israelite, um, not all of them are anti-Semitic or extremists, right? right. I want to, I want to raise awareness about mm -hmm. that, right? Um, the black Hebrew Israelite movement is also divided by different uh, sex and organizations and they operate semi-independently across all of the United States. And this is why it's, it's a little difficult to pinpoint uh, who's right and who's wrong. We can right. clearly see who, who is right and wrong, but even within the ones that are right, you even have division the there because some of them are old Testament, strictly old Testament and reject mm -hmm. Jesus completely. But then there's others that that believe in Jesus or who, who they would say um, Yeshua, right? Because they'll use his Hebrew name. Mm -hmm. And um, that that's that's why it becomes difficult to just kind of make a general blanket yeah. statement about all of them. I do think that there are there are people um, and I'll just say this up front. Christianity is not a white man's religion. Right. Before mm -hmm. Christianity ever hit any place in Europe, it was geographically, contextually in Africa first. Yep. You yep. you look at Israel, you look at Egypt, you look at Ethiopia, you look at all of the neighboring regions of Israel, and it reached Africa way before it reached any European country. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say Christianity is a black man's religion more than it ever was a white man's religion. And I will tag uh, uh, some scholars who agree with me who had debates and were raising awareness to combat this this ideology of Christianity is a white man's religion because of the, the blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus that gets promoted. We all understand. And, and I think also what, what, what gets taken out of context is um, when you look at the book of Revelation, uh, chapter one, verse 15, oh, 
where they'll say, you know, that um, I want to I want to quote it uh, correctly. Revelation 115 and his feet were fine like brass. Um, they as if they burned in the furnace and his voice was like the sound of many waters and his uh, Jesus feet being described as dark um, or, or burnt is frequently cited as proof uh, depicting mm -hmm. Jesus as a black man. Um, but me personally, when I read that, I don't necessarily envision a black man. What I envision and what I do correlate is that the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter three that when the three brothers were in the fiery furnace, there was one that looked like the son of man that was with them. Mm -hmm. And I could imagine for me to be more biblically sound is that that was a, a Christophany. A, a Jesus in the Old Testament in the fiery furnace with them. And that is the evidence of why his feet look like they were uh, burnt or like the color of bronze. But I do say that when you see and read the descriptions of God, it does fit features of uh, the Afro-American or African descendancy, like the white woolly hair, mm -hmm. um, the skin color thing. So, there are plenty of characters within the scripture that may have been notably presumed as white or light skin that I think we need to maybe identify like these specific characters were definitely black or of African descent because they had uh, they either fit in when they went into different regions of Egypt. Right. Um, we know that. King Solomon married the Ethiopian woman. So all of there's going to be children that are going to have a darker complexion. Uh, Moses married an Egyptian woman uh, named Zipporah. Right. Um, so we're, we're seeing that the cultures are mixed in. And I would say more that it fits the description of more of a Middle Eastern. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that the focus should not always be on complexion or color. I think we missed the point when we focus on the, these specific details. The message is a message of hope. What Jesus did, you know, what 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 was actually happening, you know, the the that's the that's the meat of the message, not how tall he was, how short he was, how dark he was. He wasn't white, and I'll say he wasn't black. He was in he was somewhere in between. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, and I would raise um the high level kind of point that you see in academia and scholarly circles all the time. Psych, who cares? Who cares? Like, right? What, you know, it's valuable to know what the geographical ethnic context of a lot of these passages was. Right? It would be a lie to say they were all Caucasian boys in the middle of the Middle East. That's just not true. You know, but at the same time, who cares? Like, it, it, it's 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 crazy to me because I could point to Christianity and say, who was in charge of the abolitionist movement? That was Christians. That was all Christians who upended their own. It's true that, quote unquote, you know, Western powers were the ones who were, I guess, the most, quote unquote, historically visibly, historically visible, successful slavery traffickers right even though slavery happened literally on every continent every country since the beginning of the history of man but a lot of these groups these extremist racial black supremacist white supremacist groups let me tell you something these guys are brothers and they don't even realize it a lot of the core fundamental ideologies that create a black supremacist on the corner of 149th and third avenue or that create a white supremacist in the middle of northern texas 50 60 60 years ago are both tied to the exact same fundamental human error our racial group or our group of people an extension of myself an extension of my ego my pride my value and the culture is under attack by some outside force to varying degrees depending on what point of history we're at and we must base not 10 percent not five percent not 30 percent but 95 to 100 percent of who we are as human beings on this one level of pigmentation in the skin alone who cares who cares mm -hmm. it jesus didn't care about it you have any number of parables that range from the good samaritan where you had a jewish man who was assaulted you know 
basically on the verge of death. His own countrymen passed by him, didn't do anything to help him out. And a Samaritan, someone from an antagonistic culture, an antagonistic ethnic group came by and helped him. That is such a real life depiction. I've had Puerto Rican friends who are like brothers to me. And I've had Puerto Rican guys who are like enemies to me. I've had black friends who are like brothers to me. And I've had black guys who are like enemies to me. Like it, Pigmentation is so far off the mark that it makes me think they lost the plot completely. It will be the equivalent of me playing chess with somebody somewhere and telling them, well, you know, you you they'll get into it and be like, well, the only reason I didn't win that tournament, I didn't win that game was because on C7, I didn't do this and I didn't maneuver in this point. I'm like, dude, you don't have any of your pawns on the board. You've thrown them all away. You're focused on everything but the fundamentals. And because of that, mm. your entire core philosophy has just gone off the rails. And like David said, also, we want to be fair to the movement because a lot of times when you talk about Christianity or any ideological group, the extremist fringe of it gets portrayed as the entirety. And mm -hmm. as much as I personally don't like the black Hebrew Israelite movement or philosophy, I can't lie about them either, right? We have to treat them fairly as a mm -hmm. whole, the, the, mm -hmm. the beliefs that they have. And it's a wide, varied belief set. It's pulled a lot of ideas from Christianity, from Judaism. It's pulled it from a lot of esoteric and Eastern philosophies, um, even leaders of their movement had have had very, very distinct and varied beliefs. Like you had Wentworth Arthur Matthew. He was part of the commandment keepers faction of the black Hebrew Israelites. He said the black man is a Jew. All genuine Jews are black men, but he was very cordial overall to Jews in general. He was not antagonistic, not violent. In his faction, eventually the movement fell apart. It disintegrated and everybody within it started suing each other. But they were cordial to Jewish people or traditionally Jewish ethnic people. They would invite them to their worship services. Uh, but then on the other side of the spectrum, you had people like uh, black Hebrew Israelite Marcus Wayne Chenault, who actually killed Martin Luther King Jr.'s mother, Alberta Williams King, on June 30th, 1974. He was a staunch militant black supremacist, and he thought that Martin Luther King Jr.'s mom was tied to that, and he wound up murdering her, I believe, in a church. So yeah. it, it's, a, it's a wide movement, and you have all of these soci sociologists and historians, I think the vast majority of them, from what I've seen, would not credit the majority of black Hebrew Israelites or black Jews as extremists and violent, right? That it, that's not a fair um, depiction of the movement. If we want to mm -hmm. critically address the ideas that we think are wrong, then we have to fairly address that. It's just that, you know, from where I'm standing, I understand why the guy who claims to be a Christian and a psychopath and goes into an abortion clinic with a machine gun and shoots everybody would garner more attention than just three guys talking on a podcast. Mm -hmm. In the same way that one of these black Hebrew Israelite factions on a street corner calling white people devils will probably garner a lot more attention than a bunch of them inside of a church somewhere who are just doing a quiet worship service. So I, I think it's fair to portray the movement as it actually exists and not paint it as a Looney Tunes cartoon. But at the same time, it's like I, I respect the cultural underpinnings of how the Bible transpired and the people in it. But the message of Christ is so far removed from such petty, small, trivial human matters like race that sometimes I have to ask myself, who cares? You know, mm -hmm. Christ was so much more than race. It, so much. There is no Hebrew. There is no Israelite. There's no Greek. There's no Roman. You know, under Christ, all are the same. So these guys are just like the worst manifestation of that at times for mm -hmm. me. Like they're focused on the most trivial issues and nothing that will actually help them in a spiritual sense. Or if we just want to make it, you know, more ego driven, nothing that will actually help the community that they supposedly are there to defend either in a in a purely socioeconomic way. Yeah. I want to mention this verse in the Bible, Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. It says, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, um, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are from the synagogue of Satan. This Ouch. is often something that is quoted as saying that the Jews of today are not really pure descendants of abraham right mm -hmm. or of jacob right that they actually are the authentic descendants of of jacob you know and for me when i read through the scriptures and i'm talking about like in like all of the scriptures i i believe that what you would see as uh, a known the azakani jews i might be saying it wrong but um, these Jews converted and have then moved to Israel and they are there. 
what I believe is that I don't disqualify anyone who has taken up the opportunity to convert into Judaism and keep the laws and the statutes and the commandments um, following the Torah. And I know there's some other things that are added, like the Mishnah and, and other books, but the word of God says that if anyone, any foreigner from among you stays in your land and becomes a part of your people, then they are Jews. So if anything, they should be thanked for keeping Judaism alive over all of these years. What I also find interesting is that members of the Black Hebrew Israelite movement don't necessarily identify as Africans. Right. They they mm -hmm. are separate from from Africans. They they may identify with one or two tribes who are actually tribes in Africa, but are not purely descendants of Africa. So they're like traveling amongst uh, African tribes, but they're separate. Um, I watched the movie Hebrew to Negroes, which is uh, a movie that was created. And one of their catchphrases was wake up black America. Right. So so the movie really goes into detail about the transatlantic uh, slave trade and it gives some historical context. And for the most part, I believe that it proves the point that there were more uh, blacks or, or Africans that were involved in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Um, but I don't necessarily think that it proves a point that Esau or the white man is excluded. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right. I don't I don't agree also that Deuteronomy 28 verses allow you can you can find. Um, you could identify any one of us could read the scripture and identify with things within the scripture. But I think when you when you take it personal, like. Everything it says in Deuteronomy 28 resembles what's happening to me and my culture. I think that's uh, taking a misproportionate point of description, identifying something that it really isn't. I, see right? I think that all of those things were fulfilled already. And we see that if you just can continue reading past the Torah, all of the things that happen to the Israelites, them being taken over, them being taken to a foreign land. Um, and there are some specifics, but. I think overall, any any individual group that doesn't identify with Jesus and that started off identifying with Jesus and has strayed away from that, the Bible lets us know clearly that anyone who does not believe that Jesus is the son of God or takes away that claim uh, about Jesus himself, that is the spirit of the Antichrist in full operation. Right. Um, those black Hebrew Israelites that don't believe in Jesus or don't or have separated themselves from the teachings of Paul, from Christianity, um, they're still awaiting uh, or they're not even awaiting a Messiah. They're waiting for God himself to come back. So, you know, there's verses that we can clearly see in the Psalms and other places where or in Proverbs where it says, um, this is this is uh, the one who is on the throne and, and who knows his name and who knows the name of his son. Right. Right. Um, but they'll say that. And, and I found it interesting because after doing some research, Israel is also known as the son of God. So I found it interesting how their perception or interpretation of anything that has to do in reference of a son of God is actually Israel and not Jesus. But we also understand that Jesus is the unique son of God, not just mm -hmm. the title son of God, but the unique son of God, because he's different. He's not like all of us. But yeah, guys. Hmm. Um, yeah, honestly, like it, it's all eisegesis, right? We know we know ex exegesis is the right way to interpret scripture right um but what i see a lot with them is uh like i said before just misinterpreting scripture um and making it fit to their ideologies um right and it's it's unfortunate it really is and the gospel is for everyone it is for the whole world even if you tell them 
John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right? They will legit look at, or some of them will legit look at you and say, that's the, for the world of Israel. Right. And I'm just like, how do you, <laughs> how do you add that in there? You know, like, they got a little creative you, with yeah, the text. Come on, come on, man. It's just, um, I don't know. Like I, I, it, it, it breaks my heart, honestly. And like I said before, man, the gospel is for everyone. The good news is for the whole world. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, the world. Um, and just like you should be, um, I think you were, um, referencing yes galatians three twenty eight. there is neither jew nor greek there is neither slave nor free there is no male and female for you are all one in christ and if you are christ's then you are abraham's offspring heirs according to promise it's right there like you can't <laughs> you, you can't refute that you can't you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying like uh and then verse 26 it says for in christ jesus you are all sons of God through faith. Um, for as many of you were as baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's clear. It's clear as day. We are all, we have been adopted into the kingdom. We have been spiritually uh, uh, circumcised in our hearts. Now we, we are spiritually Jews, you know, um, but man, I, I, Go ahead, Lee. Go ahead. I agree with you on the irony, Rich, of having a movement. And I, I wouldn't say this is exclusive to black Hebrew Israelites, right? Anyone who's been a st student of history knows this. Um, the oppressed normally become the oppressors later on in history. It's just, mm. it's just the way of human nature, black, white, orange, purple, green. It don't matter what color. This is just 1984 animal farm. You could go to mm. anything. Animal farm is one of my favorites. If anyone's ever read it, um, but it's basically where, you know, the animals are on the farm and I'm not comparing black people to animals or white people. So <laughs> take your uh, take your paranoia off for a second. I'm saying the story is basically about the hierarchies of power in general, human power. And the animals rebel against the owners of the farm because the farm is using and exploiting them to produce labor and produce goods. And the animals come together and they decide, you know what, let's uh, let's make this a place for us. Let's take it back. So the animals rebel, they kick out all the human owners and they start running the farm. And eventually in the story, the animals start doing actually very well. And they start out producing all of the rival human farms around them who are kind of conspiring against them. But amongst all the animals, there is one select group and it's the most crafty or intelligent ones and they're pigs. And as the book progresses towards the end, what eventually happens for anyone who hasn't read it, spoiler alert, is that the pigs begin to plot against the farm itself. And eventually at the end, it says that the pigs walk in with human clothes and the other animals kind of look at them. And it, it's almost like a repeat of what happened in the beginning of the story where they were under the thumb of humans. Now they're the, under the thumb of the pigs who are part of, were initially part of the animal grouping. But it, it's kind of a, a cautionary tale about the human condition and human nature and how it's not necessarily about what social group you belong to or what racial group you belong to. Everybody is tainted on this planet by the infection of sin and anyone mm -hmm. given enough power will oppress those beneath them with less power. And if we're being honest about the conversation, then we have to also say that evil begets evil, right? We can't just pretend that in the United States specifically, well, this is something I've heard some of my fellow conservatives and Republicans say, not to get too political about it, but that's, I think it's an important part of the conversation on why groups like uh, black supremacist groups, white supremacist groups find members and grow sometimes. But in this country, you know, all over the world, great evils are done to all races, most of the time by their own kind. But in this country specifically, a great, great transgression was done against the black community. And I could be watching this now and I, I feel absolutely zero guilt about what happened 200 years ago. I had nothing at all to do with those evils. But great, great evils were done to this community in a way that has left a mark that has kind of reverberated through time, even till this point, you know, mm -hmm. someone would tell me, well, Lee, I wasn't a slave owner and I don't feel guilty about that. And I'm like, you're right. I, I don't think in a biblical sense as a Christian, you should feel guilty about that, but recognizing the conditions of today and how evils of the past have created an atmosphere where new evils can take place, I think is an important part of addressing extremist groups like this and kind of pointing people towards biblical truth. So I'll just close out with these verses. 
I love these verses, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 33 to 37. And this right here is the marker of whether or not I think someone is a biblical God-fearing believer or is just, you know, one of the guys like Rich is saying like, oh, well, we hate exclusion and we hate how much exclusion has been done to us. And we're like, okay, what are you going to do to combat that? They're, and their solution is, well, we'll just exclude other people. It's like, okay, well, you're not really doing anything different. You're doing the exact same thing that was done to you. You're not breaking any cycle. You're probably just exacerbating it and creating new horrors for future generations to suffer through. But Leviticus 19, 33 to 37 is awesome. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, like David was saying earlier, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you, are for, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the mm -hmm. Lord your God. Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weights, an honest ephah and an honest hin. These are measuring tools. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Keep all my decrees and all my laws and follow them. I am the Lord. And that is, I don't think for anyone listening, especially my conservative friends, that that's a blanket generalization that anyone who comes into any country can just disregard the laws. Native born people have to obey laws too, right? And they have to be in a civil society and they have to contribute. But it's important for us to remember, we can't go back in time and change what our forefathers did in the black community or the white community, Hispanic community, wherever. But we can change the way we perceive others today in our own Christian walks and the way we treat them. And I think it's important for us to remember that a lot of the evils we see today with extremist groups were created by evils done in a vicious cycle that never ended until Christ came onto the scene. And the commandments of Christ are to love people who are not like you, racial group, different religious beliefs, different lifestyle choices in general, love them, not necessarily condoning what they do or don't do, but loving them and treating them with the dignity that humans are commanded by the Bible to treat each other with. And in this way, maybe minimizing the types of sins and minimizing the types of racial supremacist groups or other supremacist groups that can kind of rise out of the ashes of people doing evil things to each other in oppressive ways. So mm -hmm. I think that's important. I think there will be a lot less white supremacists and black supremacists and Chinese supremacists and Mexican supremacists and even Dominican supremacists. I've met a few of you. If we treat each other the way Leviticus talks about, we, we're treating people with dignity. We're treating them as peers. We are the good Samaritans. We don't care what color that guy is on the side of the road who got trashed and beat up by a gang. We're there to help because that's what Christ commanded us to do. Mm -hmm. You know, being that you just dropped a whole bunch of nationalities, that brings <laughs> me into the next portion, which is some of the parts of the organization have ascribed certain tribes of Israel to particular nationalities. So I want to mm -hmm. name a few. So here goes the list of the 12 tribes of Israel. Do I get one? Yes, you do. Yes. So the tribe of Judah <laughs> is attributed to the American blacks. Okay. Anyone who's black in America is a tribe of Judah. Uh, West Indian blacks are from the tribe of Benjamin. Haitians are from the tribe of Levi. Puerto Ricans are from the tribe of Ephraim. I'll uh, take it. Yeah. Uh, oh, I just Cub disappeared. <laughs> Cubans. Yeah, you so white, you disappeared. <laughs> Puerto, Puerto Ricans are Ephraim. Cubans are Manasseh. Uh, Dominicans are Simeon. So I'm Puerto Rican and Dominican. So I guess I would have Ephraim and Simeon. Mm. Um, Guatemala and Panama. Uh, also part of the Mayan Indians are Zebulon. Uh, Native American Indians are Gad, and the Simonelli Indians are the tribe of Reuben, Colombia to Uruguay, uh, the Incas, uh, the in Incas Indians, right, hmm. are the tribe of Asher, the Mexicans or the Aztecs are Issachar, and Argentina and Chile is the tribe of Neftali. What? Why did the black supremacists that I met on these corners tell me I had a whole tribe? Why they kept calling me the devil over and over. I, I do turn red when I'm laughing or mad or sad <laughs> or any reason. So I, I get the correlation, but they never told me I had a tribe. Yeah, well, you, you need to just straight up tell them I'm Puerto Rican. I'm not I'm not white. Oh, okay. That's the that's way. That's why if you tell them I'm Puerto Rican, then they'll tell you, oh, you you are brother Ephraim, right? Right, right, right. That, it's like that it's like a racial minefield. It's like as long as I don't identify as this race they hate, we're cool. 
you know, I got to right. step over the mine and, over there. And, you know, I, I'll say this. Right. So we understand that the term Jews is a shortened version of the word Judah that all Jews can trace back to uh, the Judah, the son of Jacob, right, who was named Israel. Right. And. I know that they've done some people have done an extensive research on trying to identify the lost tribes of Israel. And I think that this is they're able to pinpoint some of these things because in the Bible, there are 10 tribes that are lost. Right. And biblically speaking, uh, Benjamin, uh, uh, Judah absorbed Benjamin and they kind of became one. And then the other 10 tribes um, became scattered. Right. Mm. So there have been instances around the world where certain regions in Asia and certain regions in um, in Europe, there have been and even in India where there were what were seemingly Jewish sects within those regions that were known as people that traveled from another place because they were persecuted, but they kept all of the traditions of the Israelites. And I always found amazing that you can go to these regions around the world and there's just a people group that migrated from a different place and they have traditions of the Israelites, like keeping the Ten Commandments, the law, the Torah, and all that. Um, and they've been um, they've been obs they've been ob uh, observed and absorbed by the Jewish people. But I do think that there's some credit to them actually being descendants of one or one or more of these tribes. When we see and you do your deep study of where they actually went to or where they were dispersed in. Um, I will say this, that I, I, I learned about this 12 tribes of Israel stuff and how they promoted that Puerto Ricans were from the tribe of Ephraim. And I'll, and I'll say this, there are stones that were found in Puerto Rico that are ancient. Let's have, go. Yes. Listen, and they have it. <laughs> Puerto Ricans are the real Jews. I'm gone again. I got raptured. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> There, there are stones that were found with Hebrew inscriptions on them, and it's believed that that is um, it's been authenticated that is actual ancient Hebrew on these stones found in Puerto Rico. Let's and go. they have articles on it. I'm gonna I'm gonna tag the article on this so all you Puerto Ricans find out your Jewish heritage. I love Jewish. It Out matches. <laughs> we are Goya Jews, bro. We're yeah. Goya Jews. Let me let me also give some terminology, right? Some, you know, extremist phrases, right? So number one is when you hear the word, when they say the word camp, that means a street teaching event or the organization itself. So identi they identify as camps. Um, anything that has to do with Edom, Edomites, Esau, uh, we know that that's the twin of Jacob. And according to their teachings, they are the ancestors of the Caucasians. Um, Esau is described as red and ugly. Um, <laughs> Perfect for me. <laughs> right. And Jacob is described <laughs> as dark skinned. Um, these uh, references are meant to be insulting, right? They show the clear racial differences between Jacob and Esau. Um, the other thing is uh, Jewish is actually a negative term for the mainstream sect because uh, they they claim that those Jewish people are actually imposters. So they are they strictly identify as um, Israel or Israelites or, or black Hebrew. Um, so they they stay away from that. The term Jew, they have a, a street teaching units. They really emphasize a lot on that synagogue of Satan stuff. Um, and if you ever hear THM, that means the most high God. So they'll rep, they'll talk about Yahweh in that way, like the most high God or the most high. So that's just yeah. some BHI phrases that I thought may be important for you to look up. Um, and in your time, you know, if you ever come across them and, and they mention that 
also in 1966, there was an African uh, Israelite uh, founder by the name of um, Ben Ami. And he's the one that started uh, that movement back in 1966. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So now it's kind of descended into what it is today. But mm -hmm. he had about a 400 member um, church that actually, you know, grew in such a in such a mighty way. And, and I'll say this, right? You know, I'll end with this. There have been a lot of injustice to our black brothers and sisters in America. Yep. It was years ago when every other month or week, it seemed like there was an extreme police brutality um, against an African-American person. And what really opened my eyes to what's happening here is that I have a, a, a fellow sister, a believer, and she definitely is a contributor, good citizen contributor to society. She she served um, as a EMT in the paramedic world, and um, she had she has three black sons. And when that time period happened, what was in my heart was it doesn't matter how well she raised them. The fact that they are young black men, they're going to get discriminated against just by the fact of their very color. And to me, that was totally unacceptable. And I would never know what it's like to be stopped by the police because of my color skin, right? But I remember a time where I was, and I felt some fear, and I'm not black as in the skin color or brown, right? right. Um, and I can't even identify or imagine what it's like to be... Um, in that case scenario and be a darker skin tone, you know? So I do think that we need to promote uh, police and community, uh, urban communities uh, with black and brown kids to promote that the police are not there to cause violence, even though it's just like, we don't want to say that the black Hebrew Israelites is those street preachers. We don't want to say that the that the police are all of the corrupt ones that did bad things, right? Because they are they are good cops, whether anybody wants to admit it or not. Yeah. So I think there's a fine line where we can fight for justice and fight for reform. You know? Okay. Yeah. I would I would close by saying we got to be real. I'm Puerto Rican. I was born and raised in the Bronx. All my friends are minorities. Any crime statistic you go across, and I, I guess we don't want to get too political, but we're just trying to address like the complicated truth of the human situation. You know, it's true. Police brutality is a thing that I have never had to worry about as a white man in New York City. But it's also true that I was raised in the hood. And I know that the disproportionate amount of violence that occurs in those lower income neighborhoods by people of color, by minorities like us, is a real thing, too. So it's like... It's a balancing act between the two, right? The Christian is called to be fair and just. Is the Christian supposed to lie and say that the black community has not suffered injustices, that other racial groups have not suffered to the same extreme in the U.S.? No, we're not supposed to lie. We have to face that reality. But is a Christian also supposed to lie and say that within our communities, within minority communities, crime is higher. The culture does encourage aggression at times that allows young men and women to be vulnerable to these types of extremist groups. I can't say it's one or the other. It's both. It is true that we have to keep an eye on law enforcement. As Christians, we have to hold the institutions that we're part of publicly accountable. But it's also true that we have to hold our own culture accountable. When I hear three artists that are icons in the Puerto Rican, Black, Dominican community talking about raping, talking about murdering, talking about having as many hoes as possible, then there has to be accountability in our community too. We can't just keep sure. pointing to the outside and say, oh, it was always <clears throat> someone else who did the oppressing. You know, a lot of times we oppress ourselves, too, with our culture and our behavior. And I think that you listen, closing, closing now, We're this topic, we go on forever. Closing, closing now. If you're a black Christian, a white Christian, or whatever Christian listening to this, you are not going to have a lot of friends on these topics. One group is going to tell you to hate cops. Another group mm -hmm. is going to tell you to hate the crime committed by minorities. You're going to have to find the line that Jesus found by telling the truth. And the truth is in the middle, usually. And the truth does not have a lot of friends. You're not going to find a lot of Puerto Rican or black guys who are going to go, yeah, you know what? I lived in the Bronx. It's true. 
there is a disproportionate amount of crime. The culture seems to be inherently more violent in these lower income areas. It's true that I've seen guys running out of Dwayne Reed stealing milk gallons and ice cream. And they've had to have padlocks on the ice cream container, like the ice cream refrigerator at 8 a.m. in the morning. I never saw that in lower Manhattan. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but there are realities that we have to face if we want to solve these things. And as mm. Christians, if we're going to try and minimize the amount of extremist supremacist groups that come out of anything, then we need to be honest with ourselves and look in the mirror. And the Bible commands us to love the foreigner, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But to do that means to be honest with who we are. And I think it's okay to look at police brutality and things we can do to minimize it. But I think it's also equally important to look at ourselves and our culture and what we're doing so that we can fix that in a more Christ-like way. So not, not bashing anything you said or the experiences mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of your friends at all. It's very true, especially in my circles, which are conservative. They don't turn a blind eye towards it, but they definitely do minimize the distinction and the suffering that the black community has faced. It's true. But I've noticed within minority communities, the black community, communities I know, Puerto Rican community, they will minimize the amount of self-destruction in the culture that they do and point to an outside enemy. And I think if we're going to stop black Hebrew Israelites or future versions of the KKK or whatever group comes around, it has to be with the truth. And Christianity mm -hmm. says we have to treat our neighbor like we would treat ourselves. Right. Yeah, I'm going to end with this. Uh I am part French, so I might be in trouble, guys. I we might be in trouble. <laughs> Do they get a try, David? Oh, no, no, no. No, <laughs> no tries for the French, all right? But Rich but... is darker than both of us. <laughs> it might be over for me, guys. I don't know. Hopefully, just save me a seat just in case, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> but, yeah, man, in all honesty, like, listen, this is for the uh, uh, extremist um, group, Uh humble yourselves humble okay. yourselves you know mm -hmm. god opposes the proud but he lifts up the, the humble you know um stop getting your doctrine from kanye west stop getting your doctrine from jay-z or chance Ken the rapper kendrick, kendrick yeah Lamar kendrick come on and his like, album that dropped yeah. in 2012 <laughs> like come on stop stop getting your doctrine from these people man read the bible and and earnestly desire the truth and i promise you our lord and savior jesus christ is going to guide you to the truth stop allowing these people to lie to you to deceive you um again the gospel is for all i just want to read from first peter three uh first peter one three sorry blessed be to god but blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ according to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who Amen. by God's power are being guarded through faith for our salvation, ready to be revealed. And the last time, guys, the gospel is for everyone. Again, there is neither Jew nor Greek, anyone, no Gentile, anything. Nothing, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Search for the truth. The only truth is Jesus Christ, and he is the only way to heaven. It's not a, It's not your skin color that gets you to heaven. It's right. your faith in Christ that gets you there. Amen. That's all I got to say. And as promised, as I mentioned earlier, I do want to share some names of some black theologians that have contributed to Christianity. As promised, I'm going to drop their names because I will say that theology has a lot of whitewashed in there. And I think it's important for us to know who are our black theologians, who are who are our Puerto Rican theologians. But right now, because it's Black History Month, we're going to focus on the black theologians. When we get the Hispanic Heritage Month, we'll mention the Hispanic one. So here's the name. Uh, Reverend Alexander Crumwell, um, James W.C. Pennington. Richard Allen, uh, C.P. Jones, and one of the famous ones that started the Black Liber Liberation Theology Movement by the name of James Cone. So there's some Black theologians. There's a lot more, um, but just for the sake of time right now, I'm just dropping a few names. Uh, God bless you all. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy. Like, share, subscribe. Share your thoughts in the comments section. Yes. And share what tribe you from, you know, <laughs> <laughs> unless um, you're French. 
Unless oh. you're French. <laughs> or Save partially French. Save me a seat, guys, please. <laughs> God bless you all. Thanks for God listening. God bless. Love you guys. God bless.